you can see our title is Tools, Systems and Platforms for Online Learning. I know you guys are already set up. Um, you're very much a Moodle environment at the moment. So I'm just going to show you where Moodle fits into the wider industry standard and um, also what, the, what else is out there in terms of um, LMSs. We're also going to look at student information systems or management systems for want of a better word. Um, and I'll just show you a few that are, are becoming popular. And then we're also going to be looking at authoring tools as well today. So um, I'm just going to show you uh, what's popular, but also what we use at MBA. Uh, we do quite a little bit of um, content uh, development now. And I'll just show you the tools we use. And then you guys can have a think in terms of of what is appropriate for your context. All right, so that's, um, that's going to be today's program. Um, the facilitator, oh, that's, hang on, that's me. That's our little rundown. So I'm going to be looking at learner management platforms or learner management systems, student information systems or management systems, uh, some authoring tools. There's going to be two breakout session um, activities today. All right. Um, I'm going for 90 minutes, but it might be less. Um, it won't be more. We will definitely wrap up inside 90 minutes, but it's all according how deep down this rabbit hole you want to go. Yep, it's me again. Um, so uh, next week, you will have a change of voice, which is always a good thing. Uh, Neil will lead next week. I'll be around, but Neil's going to lead when we talk about... Uh, um, uh, funding, budgeting, and um, various different business models. Um, and then we're both going to support the last one, which is the wrap-up and some strategic planning. All right. So this is the last time you're going to have to put up with just me. Um, I'm uh, trying to juggle all the balls this morning. Let's see if I can pull it off. All right. However, before we get going on today's program, we need to just look back at last week, and I wanted to see how receptive you were. Um, so the names on the left-hand side of that slide are the people who are actively engaged in the various discussions. So we did say that if you want your completion certificate, you had to get involved in the remaining forums. Um, and so those people are looking good in terms of getting their, their certificate. If you want the certificate and your name is not on the list, then I say you need to get involved in the last remaining, the last remaining forum discussions. Okay. Um, just lurking in the background, attending the synchronous um, components of the course is just not enough. We will give you half a certificate because you only did half. All right. Management has said I can use some muscle to get you guys uh, involved. So there you go. All right. Those people, thank you very much. They are the usual suspects. I've been checking on the forums and you, um, they, these people pop up regularly. Um, they're my, the teacher's pet. <laughs> and what's nice is that the discussion is really, really, it's good. It's profound. So um Thank you very much to uh, those people on the screen. You're making it a very rich environment uh, in terms of learning. Thank you. All right. So the, the forum discussion uh, last week was uh, in the breakout rooms during the synchronous session, we talked about um, uh, how do we need to change in terms of summative assessment. And there was quite a lot of discussion in the breakout rooms and the feedback afterwards, right? Saying that, yeah, we, you might need to rethink the assessment strategy uh, going into the future, especially as more and more uh, exams now, exams, you remember, I wasn't a fan of the exam. I preferred authentic and continuous assessment. I thought that was much more meaningful. Um, especially if you had constructively aligned your objectives and your assessment. Do you remember that? Um, then we said, okay, in the forum, though, what about a role for formative assessment? You might remember I split it up into three, three components, um, uh, diagnostic, formative, 
and summative assessment. I said diagnostic informative can be done very nicely online. All right. And I said the problem was with the summative assessment, if you were trying to emulate the exam environment. Okay. And I'm saying that surely this is an opportunity now to break away from that. Uh, in the discussion, it was made clear that there is sometimes it's mandatory because of legislation, but we were arguing that it's very easy to justify um, a more meaningful approach to summative assessment, which actually measures real learning rather than just this ridiculous comprehension style exams that have become the norm throughout the most of the developing world. All right, that that was my hoo-ha. So then we said, what about formative? And then you guys had to think about what was going on. And then the, I've just chosen two um, from the uh, from the the host of different replies. But these two I thought were interesting. Franco uses he says the formative evaluation at ISCED has no probative purpose. I had to go and Google probative to make sure I understood it properly. All right. But basically, it means that um, what he's saying is that ISCED doesn't in any way mandate a role for formative assessment. All right. It's just not mentioned. Um, the, it's kind of assumed that if it is done, it's really the teacher's prerogative to whether they want to use formative or not. All right. Um, it's incorporated in the act of teaching. It's integrated in the formative action. It is used with the objective of better following the student's academic development. In my point of view, it must be emphasized as a way to better control the teaching and learning process. And there's no doubting that the research is very clear that formative assessment is an excellent way to encourage learning. All right. I think so to make it easy. Oh, oh, then we said, should you be using apps outside of Moodle was the th third part of the discussion. Um, and remember, you guys did a Kahoot test uh, during one of the sessions. So you've had a little experience of what formative assessments like using a third party app. And uh, Franco says, I think we should use that type of, of technology. It makes it easier for students who don't have access to Moodle when it leaves them off the platform. All right, so I, I would think though that your Moodle would always be your core, your central component of which all the other little bits and pieces would leverage off. So I would say if your students can't access Moodle, then they need to get themselves organized and maybe you need a support mechanism to help them. But if they can get Moodle, then they should be able to get many of the other third party apps as well. Okay, Izzy Drogue came at it, he said, Formative assessment and ISED play an important role in the e-learning process. Formative assessment is uh, there throughout the process that nowadays is one of the most powerful tools in e-learning. The activities related to formative assessment most used by ISCED are tests, forums, and quizzes. Okay, I'll go with that. Is there something that should be emphasized? We should emphasize these tools, strengthen the application of activities above, <clears throat> as well as applying other methods such as clickers and videos, interactive videos, for example, games, powtoons with those animations. All right. So uh, Isidro was very similar to many, many other people in the forum who also said, now that we put our minds to it, yes, it's a good idea. But it's quite clear from the responses that it's not really as Franco's pointed out, it's not really mandated in any way. All right. And, and should we be using third party apps? Um, I agree with my colleagues, Moodle platform constitutes our classroom and we need to integrate Moodle's other apps so that it can enrich the platform and make it more dynamic and less boring. So he's coming at it slightly differently. Um, the idea is there are many plugins for Moodle and maybe we should be looking at more uh, assessment plugins, which we can use directly in the Moodle, which is not a bad idea. Um, so um, there's not really an endorsement for third party apps, but rather trying to make the existing platform Moodle um, more robust and ha have more functionality for assessment. So thank you guys. I think that's very good. And those are typical, those two comments. I went through them all um, and yes, um, 
So for management, what does it mean? It means that you guys maybe need to think about a teaching and learning strategy or a, even a policy document which says that various elements are mandated, that there should be, for example, um, a role for formative assessment. All right. I know many institutions now are looking at a teaching and learning policy so that it's very clear to um, incoming academics that um, teaching is considered a very important role, but not just any old teaching, specific way of teaching, specifically for online. And we have mentioned many of these learning design ideas, uh, module two, I think it was, where we looked at that, for example. So you could look for those values in there and then build it into a teaching, learning and assessment policy, which would uh, then mandate a specific approach to teaching and assessment. Okay, thank you guys, very nice. All right, so today's program then is more about what tools, platforms, and systems can we put in place in order to make sure that we are um, using the best of the technology for what it's for, but within the context of Mozambique. Okay, we don't want to go all bells and whistles and then no one can access it because data is too expensive, for example. So we've got to keep that in mind. But um, so first of all, your learner management system. And I think from the comments in the, in the forum, it's clear that you guys appreciate your LMS is key. You don't have an institution if you don't have an LMS, all right? So um, maybe there should be regular investigations into what is available out there. And are we using the best tool for our job? If it is so critical to the way we do business, then surely there should be some type of audit, some type of checking up, um, and uh, obviously some, um, some love and maintenance poured into the LMS. All right. What is an LMS? Um, um, in case you're not clear, I would be amazed if, if um, you're a bit shaky on what an LMS is. This is key to your business model, all right? But uh, I found this nice little diagram. Um, it's by a little company here in South, Af South Africa called Eiffel Core. They do a whole load of systems integration as well as a bit of materials development. Um, and I thought this was probably one of the best visual representations I've seen of what an LMS uh, on, uh, offers. They've divided it into four components. Um, admin and course management. And we talked about course management in the section on facilitation and how important it is. Um, the, uh, but obviously here is where we get things like uh, enrollments. You have a look, we've got, that was a bit small for me, announcements, retention tools, evaluation, reports, um, sending out notifications, uh, even some coaching, etc. Uh, and I would say it's also like it's tracking what students are doing, chasing up people who are falling behind, um, uh, making sure that all the, uh, the scripts have been marked and all that type of stuff is kind of your admin and course management. Uh, if we go down and look on the left hand side, bottom left, content. So obviously your LMS then is where you push out your content. All right. And um, just to give you how they've divided up each of these four quadrants, they've divided them further into things or apps or functionality that encourages thinking. Uh, the green is facilitates good teaching and the bluey, tealy color is uh, encourages levels of socialization, even though it's remote, all right? So under content, uh, that's where you offer your lessons. That's where you provide them a little repository of documents. It's where you could have a glossary. It's where you might have their content or their books or their textbooks. Uh, where you might even store the multimedia, etc. All right. So um, that would be the another component of what your LMS is doing. Collaboration, top right. Um, these are uh, ways that the facilitator, the participants, uh, management, etc., can engage and work together. All right. 
uh, in this diagram. They've got email, blogs, discussion forums, which you've used much a lot now. You can organize the students into groups. You can have a chat facility. They can build collaborative books with a wiki. They can store their ideas in a journal. Uh, and you can even get them to uh, poll, um, like, uh, vote on various aspects using the polling idea. And then the last quadrant, bottom right, assessment, which we spoke about last week. Um, yeah, um, this is where you can run all your tests, keep all your grades, um, uh, the, uh, and so on. So I think you've got that. If there are any queries about LMS, then what it is, then yeah, you got to get up to speed fast. But I'm pretty sure you guys got it. However, when I was doing the research for this little um, presentation, um, in my mind, I've always known there's been this, this tension between the different types of LMSs, but I never in my mind really formularized what, it, what was this, the difference. And then I found this one article which I thought came up with a very good way of categorizing different types of LMSs. And um, it's the, I must thank e-learning industry. Um, I've re relied very heavily on two or three of their articles. I thought they were pretty insightful. Um, and so here is this tension between the, the, the offerings. So um, as you might know, um, quite a lot of LMSs, the, the platform itself uh, is licensed as open source. You can take the, the core, you can add additional functionality on yourself, but basically um, it's yours and you're responsible for how it works and how secure it is, etc. So that's the blue side on the left, um, your own open source LMS and the advantages of going this particular route is obviously it's extremely low cost. There's no subscriptions for the actual core materials. Um, in fact, the core is free, but there will be costs involved in terms of looking after it and maintaining it and putting in the patches and um, so on. So it's, 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 it's low cost. All right. And so small and organizations which don't have a lot of resources tend to like to go this particular route. Um, the How the model works is that obviously you are responsible for the server, all right? It's got to sit in a room where you are comfortable that it is secure and that it can run 24 seven. If your server goes down, your, your institution is closed, all right? All learning stops, okay? So here you are boasting, oh, hang on, I've got a whole load of people waiting. Um, here we are, um, going on about join up ISED, you can learn 24 seven, blah, 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 blah. But if your server goes down, then that's a lie. All right. So you've got to be responsible for um, allowing the, um, uh, for maintaining the server and making sure that it's up and running. Um, so therefore you need a little team of men in white coats. <laughs> I don't think they wear white coats really, but, um, specialized technicians, specialized professionals who can look after the um, LMS, protect it, and then also increase its functionality as and when uh, you decide you need more. Okay, why are all these people coming in so late? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the trick is um, you, you've got to source these people and you've got to keep them. All right. So in Africa, one of the problems, of course, is that these people are rare and um, it's quite difficult to retain them. All right. Once they become skilled, they get sucked into commerce and various other places where the same skills can is more lucrative for them. Um, however, having said that, uh, the nice thing about these open source LMSs is that there is a large international support um, uh, community and you can use uh, their ideas and ask for help etc so that is on the one side and you can see there are various advantages and various challenges of going this particular route but then the opposite 
well, they still offer the same services, but the opposite model uh, is these cloud-based learner management systems, which are becoming extremely popular, all right? So the idea then is um, they're not free, but they they tend to be reasonably cost-effective if you shop around and get one that's good for you. Um, they There you don't need a technical team. All the maintenance uh, in terms of the technical side of things is done by the um, these, the institute uh, by the service provider, and um, so therefore um, updating it, giving you the latest version, all that just disappears. You don't have to worry about that. You can just get on with all the course administration because you have full control over how your courses are organized and how you collect the data for your courses, etc. So you rather, instead of having a technical team, you just need a skilled administration team in order to uh, look after your LMS. Um, suitable for multi-campus institutions. So one of the problems with um, uh, the other, the uh, other model is that if you've got lots of nodes, lots of campuses, and ideally they all want their own LMS, then it gets very messy, right? And you've got to replicate all the problems. But if you have it in the cloud, then it's not an issue at all. They can, um, you can have the same, exactly the same setup for every uh, campus. Um, and the other beauty of a proper cloud-based solution is that should you suddenly have an enormous en enrollment, um, uh, you've got a big influx of new students, then you don't have to worry about increasing bandwidth or paying your uh, internet service provider uh, for more traffic and all that type of thing. It's factored into the business model. So as you expand and we have more traffic, they offer you more bandwidth. And then when it, it works the other way as well. When you don't need it, then it shrinks. Um, so uh, that's also quite useful as well. So, all right. So in your minds, then you decide, is the model we've chosen for ISCED, uh, you've gone the Moodle route. So you're on the left. Is it ideal for our institution? Um, and obviously, you've got to balance it up. And there are pros and cons with both sides. So keep that in mind. Uh, any questions before I go on? Is that kind of agreed? All right, so who's who in the zoo? It changes every year when you have a look at who's now rated as the best LMS in the world, um, then the list uh, is in flux. All right. At the moment for 2020, docebo, I believe it's pronounced, it's a cha, cha sound. Docebo is a, a, apparently, according to e-learning industry website, um, is the number one. All right. Whether they've paid some money to make sure they're on the top of the list, I, I don't know. Uh, normally, I, I do respect their journalism on e-learning industry site, um, but I don't know the shenanigans that goes behind the scenes. And as a South African, I'm extremely dubious of these lists, all right? Um, so um, the according to them, though, they would put, the, there's the top 19. Right. And if you run your eye down them, there are some I've never heard of before. So it's a very competitive market where there's lots of new players, slightly different models, different emphasi, uh, and so on. Adobe Captivate Prime is uh, well known, though. Um, the Talent LMS is fairly well known. Litmos gets some exposure. It's an SAP SAP um, solution. Um, and then the other one I'm aware of, iSpring. Uh, we've used some of their stuff, but not the LMS before. Yeah, I'm afraid that's about it for me. I, that, when I looked at that list, I was amazed at how many new names are on there and, and so on. Um, where's, where is Moodle? Nowhere. It's not on that list, all right? There is, uh, in their website, they do have a little, what are the top open source? options all right and then there's the 
five that they offered up. So whether they have a slight bias towards the subscription-based cloud services, I don't know. Um, if you go back a slide, at the top, there is how they ranked them, the criteria um, uh, in terms of which LMS is the best one. They used customer support, customer experience, the features in the software, uh, the innovation in the software, customer reviews, economic growth potential, the company's customer retention, how, how long people stayed with them before abandoning and going to somewhere else, employee turnover, and the company's social responsibility were the criteria they used, and they obviously had some algorithm, and then they came up with that list. All right, so make of it what you will. All right, um, so in the top open source, which is kind of like the other prize, they only come up with five, um, but Moodle was at the top, Camillo, uh, Camillo, Camillo, I, I don't know it. Uh, Open edX I've used, it's more of a MOOC platform rather than a proper LMS, um, but that's interesting. Uh, Tutara Learn, I don't know it, and then Canvas I've used um, extensively, so I know Canvas well. Uh, but yeah, you can see my experience tends to be in the open source camp. And that is kind of a reflection of the type of clients we have. Uh, all right. However, then I thought, well, let me have a look at someone else. Maybe the lists are different. So I've put another link at the top here if you want to go and have a look at someone else's list. Um, interestingly, uh, there is strong overlap, at, but the order is completely different. Right? I think Docebo comes in at number five or something on their list, also for 2020. So again, take it with a pinch of salt, but at least you can have a look at what are the latest the latest ideas. What is interesting about Docebo is when I had a, went and had a little squiz at it, um, they go, that, well, they're punting this idea that there's an AI component to it, artificial intelligence, which kind of helps create individualized learning pathways. Sounds wonderful. How does it actually work? I have no idea. All right. Um, I would say AI is very new in terms of LMS design. So whether it's just a promotional thing or whether it really does create these individualized learning pathways, uh, we will find out at some point. Okay. All right, uh, before I go on to SISs, any queries about the LMS section? Are you, are you comfortable with your own LMS? And are you happy with it? Is it doing what you want? Anyone? Martin, are you still here? Let's have a look. Is Martin here? Martin uh, always hello. has. Uh, yeah, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, you, you know, uh, when uh, your experience is mostly with one platform, you tend to think that's the best. And uh, for us, Moodle is working quite well. Yeah, happy. Course, uh, yes, we are happy with it. Oh. I think, well, I speak for myself. Uh, 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 maybe others will have a different experience. And from my opinion, I think the Moodle is the best for uh, me. Is said. I mean, based on its wide uh, international support, and then the very um, good um, learning cycle for the administrators, and when it comes to complexity, you can start with a very low level, and then. Uh, me move up and make it more uh, complicated to suit uh, your needs. It's got this gradual learning curve and this gradual um, complexity um, um, use. So I think it is the best. And on top of all, it is open source because most of these commercial ones are very, very expensive. And I mean, it will break your budget. I mean, they will lure you into it and 
you will be down. So I think um, Mudo, at least in the meantime, <laughs> it will be the best for himself. Um, I agree with Chimuzu in the, in the idea that uh, what you know, you, you, you feel comfortable with, and then you can also start to push it because you now don't need the out-the-box version. You can start playing with all the additional functionality. So it's good to know your LMS well. But I also agree with Martin in the sense that some of these subscription-based services are really expensive for us in Africa. Our, our currency doesn't really compete with the dollar. And so what they think is, is cost-effective for us is actually very expensive. Uh, in my own experience, we've had a number of institutions move from Blackboard, which is not even on that list, you notice. Blackboard used to be the industry standard, but it's not even on that list. Um, the uh, Many institutions in Africa had a Blackboard subscription, but just about everyone's dumped it all right, and gone for some type of an open source um, uh, alternative. So even here in South Africa, where we're slightly more affluent, um, the uh, universities like UCT uses Sakai, which is also an open source platform. Um, UNISA uses, I'm trying to remember, I think it's Blackboard. Oh no, it's Pretoria. Pretoria uses Blackboard. Um, the, and uh, so I've worked on it and it's horrible. It's clunky and nasty and oh, so, but maybe I'm biased because I know Moodle inside out and backwards. I can make it jump through hoops. So I'm very comfortable in that environment. Um, but um, I would say most of my clients have moved towards Moodle and whether that's because of my bias or because it, re that it does, kind of, it's robust, it's cost effective. There's a lot of international support um, um, that those could be reasons why. All right. But I would keep an eye on those others. I wouldn't just get too comfortable in the Moodle environment. For now, it seems to be doing its job. Um, the, but is it keeping up? And one of the nice things about Moodle at the moment is they're pushing, pushing, pushing for the mobile app. So every time I look at the mobile app, it's getting better and better and better and better. So they're really, really working on there. They're also quite innovative. They've recently um, now released the idea that you can take a, an offline version of your Moodle and stick it on a, on a USB stick. So um, that's kind of useful for our type of environment. Um, they've also built a competency-based framework. So you can now um, uh, have students track their competencies across multiple courses. They have a learning plan. And the idea is that uh, if they've done course one, seven, nine, and 15, then they can get their competencies marked off that, uh, for a particular thing they're, they're, they're ready. So I do believe that um, Moodle is innovative and that they are trying to stay that way. Um, so yeah, I'm still a fan, even though my research now makes me realize that there's a lot of innovation happening in the LMS market. And yeah, we're gonna make sure that they stay on the game. Any other queries, questions, statements about your current LMS? Um, actually, currently what we are trying, uh, we are doing and trying to improve upon is that when we go back to the slide you showed about the open source on, um, on site and then on the cloud. We are trying to get a hybrid between the two, mm -hmm. whereby we are responsible for the content management and everything. We only buy a space on the cloud and we take care of everything else so that we get that sort of a hybrid and between the two so that we don't rely basically on their 
management. We have our own management. The only thing we rely on them is the space and network traffic. So that if there is a growth, it will be able to sustain our needs. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to worry about the power going off and the network being slow. So we're trying to use that sort of approach to manage our LMS. So our Moodle will just be sitting on somebody's space and then we take care of the content management. Yeah. The, uh, uh, that's the beauty of the cloud. And Moodle does have a cloud solution. So um, if you want someone else to look after um, all the security patches and the making sure that you're working on the latest version and all that type of thing, then a cloud solution is for, for institutions who do not have technical um, expertise or uh, capacity, then um, it makes a lot of sense. So some of my clients have moved on to Moodle Cloud, for example. Okay, right. Um, I'm going to push on a little bit. Um, the next component, the next platform you should have, and I'm sure you do, I will just talk very generally in, um, about SIS, a student information system. But it has many, many other names. According to who you talk to, there's a different name. Uh, sometimes it's called student management systems or um, college management systems or so on. But basically, this is the other component of a college or a institute like yourselves, um, which is often either poorly done in Moodle or um, just doesn't exist. So um, quite often the other piece that you need is some type of student information system. Um, again, I've gone for Eiffel Core. I like their little diagram here. So they try to visually show the types of things that are covered by your SIS. So um, your student records, your student information. So some of it is the biographical information about the student. Where do they come from? What's their address? Um, uh, what's their academic record, et cetera? So you've got your student bios. Um, then you've got scholarship management. Is there, uh, if you've got a, a, some scholarships organized, um, uh, who looks after that? How do, how do you collect all your data? Who's been paid what, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, human resource management is obviously about your teachers, maybe, and your facilitators and your staff. Um, uh, system administration, residence management. Okay, you don't have that issue. Uh, campaigns and inquiries, course completion, inventory of your equipment and your um, assets and your uh, and so on. Um, organization set up programs and courses. You can see there's an overlap there with your LMS. Uh, admission management. Again, maybe your SIS and your LMS should be integrated so they can either share that information. Uh, fees and payment management. Some institutions in their SIS, they're tracking who's paid their fees and then they can cut off access to the LMS. Uh, if things have got to a point where it's that um, where there is non-payment, uh, messaging and notification system, and then all your examination um, statistics. So um, again, the LMS does quite a lot of that, but um, maybe they need to be talking to each other because then that can feed into all those other components. All right. So that's your SIS. Let me just see. Yeah. Okay, here's some things it does. Your basic information management is your core service. It also helps with reporting. Okay, so maybe you have to talk to the council. Uh, in South Africa, we have our council of educators. Uh, they need to know about professional development. So uh, there needs to be some reporting to them. Sometimes it's the ministry, ministry of education or basic education. Uh, teachers can create individual education plans. All right, we're finding that some of the LMSs are doing that now, but it could be done in your uh, SIS. Admissions management. So people who've made applications and who has been accepted and who is ready to be enrolled into various courses, billing and payment. Uh, we're finding a lot of our clients tend to have three 
system. So they didn't have an enterprise system, which is kind of more where all the billing and payments are done. So it's more of a financial accounting system, a financial management system. But some SISs also do your billing and payment. Student information management. Um, this could include medical history, emergency contacts, could be your attendance register, uh, access to your grades. Many SISs have a student portal. Um, so this is not just how, you're, how are you doing in terms of your um, moving through your course, but um, how are you doing in terms of moving through your program? How are you doing in terms of doing your degree? Uh, how are you doing in terms of paying your fees? How are you doing uh, in terms of your other financial commitments, et cetera? So your student portal then looks at uh, perhaps a lot more than just teaching and learning. Registration and scheduling, students can register for courses via the application. Um, I, I'm basically, at the moment, I'm working with this company called Matthew Guinea School of Leadership and Governance here in Joburg. And that's one of the things that we're trying to get right is they want them to register for their courses in the SIS, and then they want that to automatically enroll them for courses in the LMS. So we're working on how do you get that relationship to work between the two systems that they have. Um, their SIS is proprietary. They've got someone actually creating it for them. Um, grade books and transcripts. And then when I had a quick look on the internet, you can see um, there are some examples of international SISs. Uh, Elukian, Campus Nexus, and then there's a PeopleSoft version as well. So uh, PeopleSoft has popped up many times in terms of an enterprise system. So obviously here it's a, um, an HR component that works specifically for education. Uh, workday student and Genzabar one. Can I give you any feedback on them? Nope. I haven't come across any of those ones. As I say, uh, my clients um, I tend to often use Sage as their enterprise system, and then they have a fight to get to talk to the LMS. And uh, yeah, as I say, MG at the moment has even built their own proprietary SIS and is looking for how to integrate it now into their Moodle platform. Uh, All Andrew, right. Andrew, yes. please. Uh, um, features, uh, I can't quite understand. They seem very similar. There is the information management, then student information management. And uh, w what's exactly the difference in these two cases? Uh, I mean, okay, so no, I would say information management is its job. Okay, so all types of information, uh, in general, of which okay. the, the, the rest of the list are examples of the types of things it can do. Uh, Definitely okay. the student data, uh, but it's not necessarily just their marks uh, or progress through the course, because the LMS often collects that information, but things like... Um, uh, personal information about who are their parents and where do they live and do they have any medical problems and um, mm -hmm. have they paid for their residence and blah, 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 blah. So all of those more logistical issues rather than teaching and learning tend to be done mm -hmm. in the SIS. All right. Um, and you can see then the billing and payment. I would say that quite often there's a third system which does that and then the three are supposed to come together and share information and that's the headache is that quite often that's not streamlined quite often it requires someone to capture the data in the one system and then load it into the next system and that is labor intensive and it takes time and it causes delays so this is still an area where we're trying to find the best way of integrating these different things moodle is particularly bad <laughs> at those other items it just there are occasionally there's a plugin but then it's like a third party plugin and it doesn't really do a good job etc so that is what i'm often find is the headache is to get these three sometimes three different systems to all talk to each other 
um, I'm going to put you in the breakout rooms just to give you some experience of them again. The question is, how integrated is your LMS and your SIS? Now, maybe you don't call it an SIS, but all your other data that you collect about students, is there a nice relationship between the LMS and then this other information system? Right, welcome back, everyone. You coming back? Yes, you're pouring in. Good. All right, let's have a representative from room one. Uh, a volunteer, Amulkar, Annabella, Jamuzu, or Edgar? Jamuzu, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I will summarize the integration that we have uh, between the platforms and Moodle. Um, currently, the most obvious integration is the email, obviously. Uh, we, we use our email to receive our messages from Moodle and so forth. That is uh, almost a given. It's, not, it's, it's automatic. Uh, then we have the ticket system. The ticket system is, where, is an area where the students can uh place their complaints their their problems their challenges etc and uh, this one is a, a, a standalone uh, platform however it's integrated with moodle there's a section created on moodle where uh, they can go there open a ticket for whatever reason that uh, challenge whatever they have and uh, this one interacts then with the ticket system and then we receive an email uh, according to the ticket. Uh, then we have Primaveras. The Primavera system uh, is basically an accounts uh, system and finances that does all the management of the student's payment and so forth. What it means is that if a student has paid fees, he has access to Moodle. If he doesn't pay fees, Moodle says, okay, I checked Primavera, you did not pay your fees so you cannot access uh, uh, Moodle. Then we have Isura. Isura is the student management system, basically the core where the student records are stored. And uh, by student records, I mean from their results, their IDs, their, their, their addresses and so forth, all student records are in this system. And the way this system integrates with Moodle is with the results. Results can go back and forth. Um, the electronic assessments on Moodle, they are at some point exported back into the ISURA, the student management system. Mm -hmm. And for the student's visualization is exported back as a score, whatever final results so that the, the students can visualize them. There's also another feature between uh, the integration with the SURA and the Moodle that is uh, the student uh, management that, uh, in the sense that Moodle uh, imports uh, students who are registered for a specific academic year from the student management system. Nice. Good. Exactly. So yeah. that's, that's how we get the students into the different courses. And again, the courses themselves, because we already have a set of courses for the specific degree programs. They are imported from the student, uh, uh, the student uh, 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 management system. I hope I did not forget anything I tried to summarize. This is basically the integration that we have there. Sounds good. For other platforms. Sounds good. All right. Uh, is everyone in agreement? Let's go for room two. Uh, 774934 or Alberto or Eulalia. Representative from room two. Uh, good morning, everybody. Come in. Yes. Uh, in the, sorry, my English is very poor, but I will try to, to explain. Your English sounds great. Can you can you summarize? Instead, we we see the integrated 
of LMS exists in the model mm -hmm. on secretary online. The student in this menu has the information about fees, has the information about their marks. For example, when, when they make an exam, they can find the results on the secretary online. So we think that the secretary online is a, it's an integration of LMS and the seeds information. And does it work well? Are you happy with it? Sorry? Does it work well in your opinion? Yes, it works well. So we have sometimes we have we have uh, problems of synchro. I don't know I don't know the right name, but sometimes the students synchronization. Results. Sorry. Yes, synchronization. Synchronization. Yes. Thank you. Sometimes we have problems of the synchronization because the students pay, but they don't see the. They still continue with the did the how can I speak? Mm. 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 Yeah. I get it. Yeah. They still continue with the mm. please help me. <laughs> yeah, I can that's help. What what she's with that, the, the, is that mm. there are cases uh, 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 occasionally where students pay their fees but somehow Moodle does not see, does not read the system, something happens there. And then the student continues blocked. You will have no access to Moodle. However, you will have paid the fees. All right. Thank you, Carmen. It's yes. great. Let's go Thank with you. Zulmi, Wisdom, Zachariah, and Zulmira, a representative. Do you agree that's nice integration between LMS and the other information systems? Andrew, hello everybody. Can you hear me? Good yes, 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 we can hear. I will. Uh, okay. Andrew, can I share my screen? Yep, let me stop mine. And I think you can now. Okay, let me see. If I can, to summarize everything. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, can, I can. Yeah, so basically this is, the, this is our, our, our systems. We have the, 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 the mobile devices for the students, which can be either a, a telephone, or a tablet or a PC. Then we have our Moodle, which is the, the, the LMS. We have our Isura, which is the uh, accounting system. No, no, which is the our student registration system. Then we have our Primavera, which is our accounting system. And these three systems are basically integrated and they share information. So all our clients can actually, uh, from, their, uh, from their devices, they can have access to all this information on a browser. So all the, these three systems are integrated so that the students can have access uh, to all the information at once. And the students access that information through the ESED mobile. So I think in summary, that's how we are organized. And are you happy with the integration? It, does it work perfectly? It works with uh, the usual uh, uh, problems of uh, connectivity, which we've learned to live with. Okay. But I think we are happy. Cool. Okay. Um, now I can stop I can sharing. Take it back. Yeah, sorry. Uh, let me. Uh, we still got another room 
uh, Florencia, uh, ISED, whoever that is, and Martin. Do you want anything further to say? As other people yeah, say this? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, the others have well explained um, how the systems um, all work. And uh, we focus our discussion on the three major systems that uh, the Kawizom uh, described the Isura, Primavera, and then the Moodle. And the Moodle is hosted outside over the cloud. And we were using a company, and I requested for a report about their um, service. And the major problem that people raised or are facing is about synchronization. How the Moodle synchronizes well with the other two platforms. So the report I received was at times it takes about two days, a very long time to get all the systems uh, synchronized because the Primavera and the Insura are hosted on campus and then the Moodle is hosted outside. And the way these three applications work is they are all open source applications. So our IT team are writing the software, the web service software for the three APIs. And I'm taking you to um, a, 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 a simple um, IT 101. <laughs> the way the three work is that they are all three different systems. They use different databases. And there's something we call the API for each system. Mm. So for them to work, you need to get the API of Insura, talk to the API of Primavera, and talk to the API in Moodle. So you have to write the software that will enable them to talk together and connect, and connect the databases and the way data is moved from one system to another. That is how you get all the three of them were talking. But as Dr. Wisdom said, right now, there's not much problem with the way they talk to each other. They talk very well, but still there is room for improvement. Okay. Because at times we may think it's working. And as I said earlier, the um, vendor providing the service for the Moodle was not making the synchronization work very well for us. So now we are trying to solve that problem. We have moved to them from them to another vendor. Right. Whose service is going to get better. So now the synchronization is going to uh, be resolved. But with our team, that was the only major problem people were facing. And Dr. Biba mentioned something about we went back to the Moodle and said we need to add more applications to make the Moodle more useful and interactive. And that is something that the IT team will work with the tutors and the coordinators for their um, opinion and what to do to make that platform more interesting for the tutors and then um, the students. But the problem of synchronization is something the IT department is aware of and I think will be something of the past very soon. Okay, sounds encouraging. Thanks, Martin. And uh, people in room four. Uh, room five, Andre, Franco, Isidro, and Cesaro. Anything further to add? I mean, I think we've covered it, but were there other points that you can think of? Okay, I'm going to, I've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to push on. And uh, if, you, if uh, room five has anything to add, can you put it in the chat? We'll keep an eye on the chat. All right, let me share my screen again. And then I'll just finish off. I've got another piece, which is, I think might be interesting to you guys. Oh, what happened to my little thingy? Oh, it's down here. All right, so the last part I thought uh, we're talking about 
technology um, in this session. So I thought also we'll look at some authoring tools. What do we use? What's become the flavor of the month in terms of making your content more interactive, make it more visual, make it more uh, exciting and engaging. And so I thought I'd look at some authoring tools. When I did a little research about what is the latest flavor, what is everyone getting excited about? I thought this kind of uh, graphic was spot on. It is exploding. There's just so many different types of tools that can be used for education uh, online at the moment. So yes, we have our LMS, but don't see that as the end game. There are so many other things that you could incorporate. Some of them are like what we saw in the assessment with their third party apps, but some of them are actual tools that you need to craft things to put inside your LMS. All right, so you can have a look at that if you want in, the, uh, in more detail but I'm going to just show you what we use. And then I'm not saying these are the best. This is just, uh, it has evolved. Um, we, we either had someone who knew a little bit about it or made a request to use this program. And over time we have um, developed a little library of tools. Okay, so as I'm saying, uh, not necessarily saying these are the best, but these are things that we have experience in. So um, you'll notice then that when we're authoring now, we're trying to get away from text-based um, resources. You, you're not going to get rid of text altogether. In fact, I don't think you, you want to, but we want to reduce the amount of information that is transmitted through text, all right? One of the problems with e-learning, as we mentioned right at the beginning, is there is that potential for it to become very dry and very boring and very lonely. All right, so we've got to kind of make it sit up and make it um, uh, sparkle so that our learners feel engaged, at least with the materials, to push on with their studies. So in terms of authoring, um, one of the things we found now is that some of uh, one of our clients, for example, likes to have podcasts. So they say their, their clients, their clients, their students um, don't have great bandwidth, but they can run podcasts. So sometimes it's just the lecture, but quite often what they really use is experts in the field giving a little pep talk of about 20, oh, uh, they try to keep them down. 10 to 15 minutes is the maximum, was well, the window. So uh, for that, we use Audition to actually clean up the, uh, the, the sound. Uh, today's cell phones have, well, especially the, 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 the flagship cell phones have fantastic microphones, uh, better than anything you can buy. So um, we often do our recordings with a, a good set cell phone and then we clean it up using Adobe Audition. And sometimes we have to chop bits out and to condense it to make it shorter, etc. Um, in terms of video editing, we're using more and more video now. Sometimes it is just head and shoulder lecturer talking, but we're trying to get away from that as well. We're trying to get out in the field and actually show more like documentary styled videos. Um, and we use a combination of, of uh, software. Uh, Premiere Pro is one of the editing tools we use, but it is a bit it is a bit fussy. So sometimes we use these much easier uh, editing tools. Uh, we sometimes use Camtasia even just to do the video editing. If I'm on my iPad, I like to use another one. It's called Luma Fusion, uh, which is more for the Apple environment. But Premiere Pro is the one we use. And then if you want some type of um, uh, visual effects, either the words must come in or there must be an overlay or something like that, we use After Effects for that. Um, sometimes though your video needs to be interactive. So it's not just passively to be watched. Uh, the, the students need to engage with the video. And then you've got to put these interactive elements inside the video. So sometimes it's a quiz. Sometimes it's a branching lesson. You've got to say, uh, let's go on to X, let's go on to Y. And then we've been using Camtasia for that and a little bit of um, some of the storyline tools as well in Articulate Studio. Photos have become very important in terms of spicing up um, much of the learning materials. I am an advocate of Photoshop. I use Photoshop to make it jump through hoops, but um, I'm also a fan of Lightroom. Lightroom helps you to clean up your photo and make it, uh, uh, make it um, uh, easy to see what's going on. Um, and then so you normally combine the two together. You first do the, 
the cleaning up of the photo in Lightroom, and then you add extra elements to it in Photoshop. Uh, we're doing a lot of animations at the moment. Animations now just an easy way to make it just sit up and uh, grab the attention of the learner. Um, we've got a subscription with Beyond. Okay, so I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, that is um, our animation package. It is a subscription based thing. So we really have got uh, two licenses for that. And then sometimes you need some type of interactivity, some multimedia um, um, components. So um, in the past we used H5P, but now we're finding it much easier to use the Articulate 360 Studio, specifically the Rise authoring package. It's got many of the H5P components in it, but it's just so much easier to use. You don't have to be a techie to make it work. Um, but H5P is free and Articulate Studio is not. In fact, it's quite pricey. So um, yeah, you've got to balance that out. And then just lately, we've started to do a lot more infographics, trying to um, get a lot of our data out of tables and bullet points and put it into some type of an infographic. Um, we have a person here at MBA who is, is quite good at Vengage. Uh, she helps put together all of these little uh, graphical elements. And so that's kind of what we use. Uh, again, I must say that we d I don't endorse any of these particularly. It's just the way that we have evolved in terms of developing content. And those are the ones we have some experience with. But I think the inner circle is kind of what you, you, you as management, you should be looking at. How do we create podcasts? How do we create our videos? How do we add interactiveness to our videos? How do we uh, edit our photos? How do we create animations? And how do we do multimedia and interactivity? So I think those are the questions management should think about. You don't have to go our route. There are many, many options, as you saw in the previous slide. I'll just show you a couple of little examples. This one is an animation. Um, Theodora has, for a number of years, offered an agricultural and rural development course for the economics faculty. She is an expert in the field, widely published, and is passionate about her subject. However, her passion doesn't seem to rub off on her students. Most do as little as possible to get by, and a few don't even disguise their disinterest and boredom. Theodora thinks about it carefully. Perhaps there's something in the way that we teach which causes the students to become bored and disinterested. The traditional approach is to provide a lecture, link it to some essential readings, and then ask the students to write a paper, then repeat this process a few times and prepare them to write an examination. She wonders, is there not another way to teach where students... All right, I think you get the idea. And um, that was put together for OER Africa. They are putting together a whole load of little learning pathways, little tutorials about how to change teaching, get away from didactic teaching towards more progressive style. So um, that's an example. And um, this one is a bit of a joke. Um, the, uh, I, I'm trading these uh, Azerbaijani tourist board people. They want to know how to create... Um, e-learning stuff and one of the briefs was to do uh, show them how to do role play so uh, we uh, I use the breakout rooms to show them how to do informal role play where you basically just organize them into little groups and let them come up with a script and they sit in the breakout room and then they come up with that and then they come back in and then they do the role play in front of everyone uh, but you can also do like formal role play and that takes a bit of prep you got to know what you're doing and so we use interactive video to show them that. I'll just see if I can play it for you. I don't know if you can see this. Let me put it over. Can you see the, oh, hang on. I don't know if you can see that. This is called TTCC3. There's no sound, uh, but the idea is the video can itself can become interactive. And they were thinking then, all right, so we would, in our training, we would develop these materials which would have these hot spots on them. So in this case, 
are um, they're trying to train their people how to uh, probe and suggest about what specific holidays they can go for. So if they choose seaside, it jumps to a specific part in the video. Um, if they and here they could have uh, examples of what to do in Azerbaijan <laughs> in terms of. I looked at their site. Um, they've got lovely hiking trails, but they got really terrible beaches. And anyway, um, not like Mozambique. Um, so then they could um, go back, and we can get them to. Whoops, this is not so great. Let me just make this. Smaller. Okay. Um, then they could choose something else. They want to do cultural. I think you got the idea. All right. So the uh, we jump to a different place in the thing. All right. You got it. Um, and so on. And then these could even be hyperlinks. So if you click on here, it'll take you to the site and you can book holiday in some mud volcano. All right. So that's the one. And then um, Another example that we're using is RISE. Uh, we're using Articulate RISE a hell of a lot at the moment in terms of trying to get away from purely text-based tutorials. So the thinking here, let me just, if I could get this up for you. Uh, again, I've got to pull it on the screen so you can see it. Um, and so here, uh, RISE allows you to very easy, you don't even have to have any technical training. You can actually get up and become an author really fast. Um, and then you, you, you create the structure of your little tutorial. Here's all the elements of the tutorial. Let's make it a little smaller so you can see. Um, then you can put in your animations. You saw an animation earlier. Um, and then you can put in your text. You've got some hyperlinks. Um, you can put in your, your graphics. You have these little um, uh, interactive elements. And you can even have a test, et cetera. Um, you can see it's all slightly animated. So you have your bullets. You can chunk using these little strips. Uh, strips. You can put in your pictures. You can ask for it to be bigger or smaller. And uh, you can have these scrolling things here to try and break up the text. It load up various um, videos on YouTube, or you can directly upload the video, et cetera. Uh, and so on. So RISE allows you to um, actually lay all this out. Uh, you can have a test as well. This one doesn't have a test. Um, but Andrew, yes, Andrew, yes. Me. We're not able to see your your screen. You you you're sharing the functionalities of RISE. All right, hang on. Let me see then if I can uh, share differently. Did you see the interactive video? Or do you not see that either? Oh, no. No, we couldn't. All right. Let me show you. Here we go. Share. All right. So this is the uh, uh, what we're using a lot for OER Africa. They want these uh, interactive tutorials, um, but they don't have a lot of skill in terms of authoring packages. So this is perfect for them. They can design um, these, uh, uh, what is their breakdown that they want to cover here? A rise allows you to then uh, show the structure. And then within each of these little elements, you can then load in the content. So um, uh, and it's okay. you, just, you just copy and paste it in or you just type it in. You can put in your little animations that you've made in Vion or very, uh, anywhere else. You can do these hyperlinks off to a different article. Um, you've got these little interactive elements here, uh, which just kind of hide some of the text. Um, uh, you can see even the bullet points are slightly animated. Okay, you can click on the pictures to make them big in case that's uh, not great. If I was in a much smaller environment, say like a phone, then it reorganizes the um, the material so that they look better on a phone element. So I'm going to try and resize my screen. All right, so say that was a phone. You can see it really, really reorganizes the the phone's a little bit bigger. Uh, reorganizes the screen so it still looks attractive, even on a phone or a tablet. 
and all the interactive elements still work. All right, so um, you can embed your YouTube videos. So all your video work, you can just either embed it directly into the Rise, it streams fairly well, or you can put in YouTube or Vimeo videos and they play uh, within the little screen. It's all nicely the integrated. Best old pupil presented with. Um, it just makes it look sexy and um, attractive. And obviously the branding is their color scheme for OER Africa. All those strange colors are theirs. So it all looks nicely branded. Um, and um, yeah, let me just make this big again. So that is, um, th that's a little, a little option in terms of uh, creating multimedia interactive environments. This, this particular one doesn't have a test, but you can load tests in as well. It keeps scores and then you can transport it either as a SCORM package into your LMS, so that you would have this embedded in your Moodle, or you can stick it uh, on your website as HTML7, and then it can just be a link within your normal website. And therefore all the interactivity still works. The only downside of using RISE is that it doesn't collect data for you, okay? Except for the fact that someone um, has completed the tutorial. Um, it's not like they can like, offer you assignments or anything like that. So that would have to be done in the Moodle, but you can embed this as the content component within a Moodle course is what um, uh, OER Africa does. So they use a combination of RISE and Moodle. All right, so you get the best of both worlds. Um, all right, I'm going to show you the interactive video uh, as well, because I don't think you saw that. And then I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap up. Um, it is here. Let's go back. Oh, oh. all right. No, I've panicked. All right. Well, okay. The bridge too far. Um, because it's now half past. All right. So um, the to finish my little uh, presentation, I've got a couple of questions for you to, to reflect on. Let me just uh, reshare my screen for my final summing up questions. All right, so today we've looked at LMSs, SISs, and a whole load of authoring tools that you could use to sexy up your, um, your, your content in terms of making your, your learning more engaging. All right, the, um, um, so what about what's for you? So um, ensure there's integration of the various management systems. And I think you've told me now that you're fairly happy. There are a couple of little gremlins, synchronization, etc. But you're definitely on a strong wicket here. When I hear other people, other institutions discussing this, this is a major headache is to get that integration to be uh, effective. Um, however, then you've got to look after these things. And I think you're uh, for also from what you said during the various report back sessions, I get a feeling now that you, you do appreciate how important it is that these various tools and platforms and systems are well maintained and that you have a team of people who are keeping an eye on it and making sure they can be as best as they can be. All right. Uh, data collection processes. These information systems are only as good as the information that is captured by them. So I would strongly say that you need to formularize a process whereby, whereby everyone knows which data they need to collect and stick it into the system. And then our other thing we've noticed at other institutions is that sometimes they capture the information well, but then they don't use the information. It just sits there. All right. So then there needs to be some type of uh, mandates that that data needs to be analyzed and incorporated into reporting, etc. Um, and then uh, the one thing, because we got a bit rushed at the end, um, I didn't really go into this, but um, the question is in terms of developing multimedia interactive content for your courses, is this an institutional need? And you need to be a little bit careful on this because the answer could be no. You might say that it is more cost effective for you to um, 
contract out whenever you have a course that's about to um, be uh, written up, then you can say, okay, let's also incorporate someone to actually develop all of these nice um, uh, graphics, videos, interactive elements. Um, for example, are there people in your area who could do this cheaply? And, um, uh, and if so, it makes sense to use them rather than have a dedicated unit in the institution, which is often more people. And if they're not being used all the time, then they become a burden in terms of cost. Um, and so I would say that's something management needs to have a discussion about. What is the role of a courseware development unit, a multimedia unit, in order to create all the assets that would make the learning much more exciting? It doesn't have to be within the institution. It could be contracted out, but you might find that the opposite is true. If these people are in short supply, then often they are very expensive. So then a, a dedicated unit might make sense. All right, I'm gonna not go any further. Are there any questions or insights based on that, those last ideas? I have a question. Um, uh, it might be a bit different from the, the, this. Uh, uh, is more about the, this approach when you, uh, at some point you said you're trying to minimize the use of text for education uh, as much as possible. So uh, my question is, um, since many students, they come from face from a face-to-face -face settings and, and they used to, to reading and so on, um, do you have some, uh, some suggestions on, on a strategy to, for example, um, for this transition, for the students from one thing they used to do uh, to a new approach for learning? Um, or, yes. Um, it, this new generation, um, I, I'm old. I'm in my 50s, all right? So my generation is uh, very much a text-based generation, is how we grew up, is how we learned. But the new generation now is very different. They are a lot more visual. Um, they are much more comfortable with technology. And um, uh, we, we find there's even a resistance to reading. But now in certain courses, reading is key. I mean, if, if you are training people to be lawyers, for example, then I'm afraid they need to read. I mean, that's how the industry, the, the profession is organized and therefore making them work through various cases and, and reading text is part of the training. All right. So I would say the question, the answer to your question then is it's different according to what it is you're teaching, uh, what you want them to learn. Okay. So I'm not saying throw text out totally. I would say that where you can, and it's appropriate, then you must start moving away from text heavy courses to, the, uh, to incorporate more visual elements. Um, as you said, some of our students are very used to face to face. So therefore a little video of a person just lecturing. I mean, it's very boring, but that would be better than giving them the, 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 the lecture notes because they're used to that type of nonverbal communication where they're watching and listening and so on. Um, the, um, even a recording of the session, some people might prefer that rather than looking at my PowerPoint presentation, you know, because they want to hear what was the nuances of what I was saying. So we've got to kind of be, the answer is it's different for each of your different courses based on who are the students and then what are the key skills that you are trying to incorporate in the training anyway, all right? And, and the answer is gonna be different. But that's part of your planning process. You might remember in module two, we were talking about learning design. In the design phase, that's when you ask those questions. What is the right approach in terms of developing an e-learning course for that particular audience in this specific environment? And uh, yeah. So I'm afraid there's no one, one size fits all answer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me go quick. 
quickly on this. Um, yes, uh, this is our approach to this. And as Andrew said, it depends on the course. And you have to plan in a way as to bring the student in. And it can be reading assignments, it can be group work, it can be even, we are now trying to get subscription to Zoom. You can have some video conference approach using the Zoom. So it depends on the course. The student has to be brought in gradually. Otherwise, the student is going to lose interest because as you said, it's a face-to-face -face, and the student is expecting what they were used to in the face-to-face -face mode of delivery. So every course is different. The way you bring students in to um, participate and enjoy the course. And those are some of the things as we go on, we are all going to work together and see how the best approach and how best we can get this done. Thank you, Martin. Any other observations about today's discussions? All right. Um, let me just show you what I've got lined up for you today. Um, um, I, I realize I've skipped a step. So let me just, sorry, let me just go back to our course. And let me get it up on the screen. Um, um, did anyone, I, I meant to have a look to see if anyone had developed uh, any of those little, um, uh, I keep losing my buttons. This is the problem with Zoom is the button keeps moving. Um, here we go. Um, I'm hoping you can now see the, um, the course page. We are on week six. And um, last week, I asked you to just investigate these various little um, tools. Um, I don't know if I was going to ask if anyone wanted to demonstrate what they had done. So if you have gone this route, we've run out of time this, this time and would, would be like, like to show what you've made, then um, please let me know and then I'll incorporate that in, in next week's one. All right. So I'll ask you to look at these little things and maybe build one or two little demos. Um, so let me know. All right. However, for this week, the, uh, the little activity is pretty straightforward. Um, I've, I would like you to have a little, um, uh, another look as what is the latest in terms of LMS development that's here. Um, and then maybe have another look at the e-learning authoring tools. We had to go very fast. We ran out of time today. All right. So if you can have a look in there. And then that question, which I couldn't ask you to answer, I would like done in the forum. Okay, so we're on to forum number eight. I would like to know what is, um, should the ISED consider having a media production unit? And maybe you've got one, but um, should we have a higher profile for it? Also, I asked you to be a little bit careful about going this route because it can get expensive. All right, so um, what is the availability of multimedia developers in Mozambique? Can you co-opt them on or could you subcontract them to create stuff for various courses? Are they cheap? Are they expensive? And do you have enough work dedicated for an authoring section? All right. So I want we ran out of time. So I want you to in the forum to please let me know what you think in terms of those specific items. All right. Um, and then uh, just to let you know that we are tracking you, we are watching, and um, the reason, one of the reasons why is because we want to give out certificates, but we're only giving out certificates to people who have demonstrated that they have been in the synchronous sessions, the Zoom sessions, but also engaged with the asynchronous sessions, which is the Moodle work, all right? At the moment, Antonio, 
Alberto, Amilcar, Abiba, Florencia, Franco, Isidro, Jao, Louis, Cesaro, Victor, Wisdom, and Zachariah have evidence that they are engaging in the asynchronous, in the Moodle work. All right. The rest of you, where are you? What's happened? Do you go to sleep for a week? No, I'm sure you don't. But hey, we want to hear, see you on the forum as well. All right. So if you want your certificate, there has to be evidence somewhere in forum number eight that you are following the discussions in the Moodle platform. Okay. So I was told I could shake my finger at you guys. Where are you? Oh, and another thing I noticed is that when I say go into the breakout rooms and then some people don't go. So why? It means they're probably not sitting at their machine. They've probably wandered off and they haven't seen the invite. Hmm. Okay. I know who you are. Okay. So that's me being big brother. I'm going to meet you next week. Neil is going to be the presenter. We're going to talk about funding budgets and business models. He's got some ideas which you might find interesting. All right. Uh, so please be on time and I'll see you next week.